Lauren Euler's essays on books and culture have appeared in the New Yorker, the New York Times Magazine, the New York Times Book Review, the London Review of Books, Harper's, The Guardian, uh, among many others. From 2015 to 2017, Euler was an editor at Broadly, the women's site at Vice. Before that, she was a freelance copy editor, again, among other things, and she was based in Berlin. And Faith Accounts, Euler's debut novel was published in February of this year. Lauren, thank you so much for joining us, albeit virtually at the library, although as we discussed beforehand, you hopefully will come in person soon. <laughs> yeah, I'm never going to leave you alone. After, uh, <laughs> I've, I've had an invitation, so. Yeah, know. exactly. Anyway. We've, uh, <laughs> I'm just gonna make sure you're spotlighted. Hold on one second. You're spotlighted and great. Okay, my first question to you, Lauren, is during my research, um, for the book today, I was rereading the book, rereading many of the interviews uh, that you've given about the book, and then reading kind of uh, reviews of the book itself. And it was described um, by a critic as a traditional novel about an untraditional subject. Oh. So my questions to you are: How is Fake Accounts a traditional novel or not? And you can reject the binary of traditional and untraditional. Um, what is its untraditional subject? And then what briefly is it about? Sure. Okay. So perhaps we could, I'll do what it's about first. Okay. Uh, so it uh, begins with a woman who is sort of fed up. She's sort of like swept up in the fervor of the 2016 presidential election in the United States. And she's um, talking about how, um, talking about the sort of apocalyptic attitude that everybody has around her. And she decides to use her sort of nihilistic feelings um, as an excuse to snoop through her boyfriend's cell phone while he's asleep. Um, she sort of, he's been acting kind of weird and she sort of like suspects he's, he has another, you know, he's cheating on her or something like that. But instead of finding that he is texting with other girls, she finds that he is, a he has a, an, a private, not a private, an anonymous Instagram account where he posts conspiracy theories. Um, that is very, very popular. And so she decides that she is going to break up with him because she sort of wanted to break up with him anyway. And she's like, but how, I have to plan the perfect breakup. Um, and before she can manage to, plan, to break up with him, something happens and she can't do it. So then she moves to Berlin and um, basically starts mimicking his behavior and becomes a compulsive liar herself. She starts making up different personalities. She goes on a bunch of online dates and tells the guys that she goes out with that she has a radically different job and, and acts completely different each time. Um, she lies to the woman that she babysits for. She uh, lies to her new German roommate in Berlin, um, all sorts of things like this. Uh, so that is, that's the sort of long plot summary. Um, the, I don't reject the, the idea of a traditional novel. I think it's quite convenient to say, to be able to say what a traditional novel is. Everybody knows what you mean by that. You mean like Jane Austen or like, um, you know, a Victorian novel or something like this. And something also that has like a story, a plot, probably like a main character or um, MC as they call it, I think on Goodreads. Uh, and, and uh you know, you sort of follow that character uh, as they encounter a problem or um, deal with something in their life, right? Uh, and that doesn't leave a lot of room for modernist stuff or like, any, you know, whatever, but, but that's a, tr a traditional novel. Um, and I was thinking about like the idea of the novel um, and what people expect when they hear novel and how to kind of play around with that while still kind of offering the pleasures of it. So like a deep uh, characterization, like a deep dive into this kind of this, this person who does have a sort of unique, <laughs> unique problem in one way or another. Um, and also um, on a very sort of basic level, like having long paragraphs of like con cohesive narrative prose that, that I quite enjoyed. And um, as a book critic, I have to read a lot of contemporary novels and was sort of, um, I'm sometimes disappointed, I was sometimes disappointed, particularly when I started writing this novel with um, the lack of like uh, a sort of classic prose style of the sort that, that made me want to be a writer in the first place. So um, that is 
the the sort of traditional novel angle the untraditional novel angle is that many people have said that this novel is about the internet or an internet novel and definitely one of the things i was thinking about was how to capture the experience of being on the internet in a novel because particularly when i started writing this um people would say things like it's impossible to do you can't write about Facebook in a novel you can't put uh like if you put an iPhone in a novel your toast it's going to be terrible and things why, like that why do you think people think that or thought that I, I think well I do think that there's like there was an idea that it was kind of faddish I think a lot of people particularly li literary people I don't know if you agree with this but I think they like expected that it would go away <laughs> right does that make sense like they didn't they don't think of it as like oh this is like one segment of our history with the internet which of course if you know very much about the internet you know that it's actually been around for a long time um but they think of like oh it moves too fast and you know it doesn't it's not it's not a universal theme the way that like marriage is a universal theme um or like like families beautiful or war right uh so they yeah, I think that there's that, there's that. And then there's also this sort of practical element, which is that the technology sort of moves too fast. Um, the phrase is planned obsolescence, right? So like Apple will develop their technology so quickly that you have to keep getting a new iPhone or you have to keep getting a new MacBook and you can't use your old like charger with your former MacBook because they've changed the, the the whatever it's called you know like the 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 outlet size or something so you can't you can't use it right and so the idea is that lots of the terminology that we use to talk about our phones or our computers or whatever becomes obsolete too fast particularly for um a book which tends to be published slowly right so i started writing my book in early 2017 and it came out in early 2021 and in that time actually even, in, you know, I wrote about Instagram and I had to keep it very like specific to 2017 because Instagram changed so much in the last four years. Um, so I think that that's another reason why people think that you can't get it. Yeah, get I'm, it glad you, I'm glad you mentioned um, this idea of the internet novel because that kind of comes up again and again. And it's also been described as capturing the neurotic spirit of a generation. So. Mm -hmm. Of the younger generation, the internet generation, me and you. Um, and what I've been very interested in is thinking about how it, it, it was this neurotic, neurotic spirit that's been responding to the book because uh -huh. you had captured this neurotic spirit and then it was the same spirit that's mostly been online because of COVID, I imagine. So you kind of described this uh, neurotic spirit especially online and then it's been the same spirit online because of COVID responding to your novel and I was wondering um, what has most surprised you about the book's reception uh, in this way and do you feel that kind of your analysis of the neurotic spirit by way of um, its kind of response to your book has affirmed its neuroticism? <laughs> <laughs> well I don't you know I didn't maybe this is too revealing, but like, I didn't really think of it as that neurotic, that neurotic. Um, I thought of it as like about a woman who, yes, she's very analytical and she thinks a lot, but she's, she's like trying to see the sort of complicated social situations that she finds herself in. Right. Um, and I think that she's sort of like kind of scheming, like trying to get the best thing out of them that she can. And I don't know if that's, I'm really hesitant to say that that's necessarily an online spirit because I think like I was thinking a lot about Philip, not like, you know, I was thinking a lot about Philip Roth or I was thinking a lot about um, there are some passages in Ben Lerner's novels as well where that I, where he, he is at, like he'll be at a party or something and he will have a really, really funny sort of play by play of his neurotic narrator's um, responses and act, like, thoughts about everything that's going on at the party and it ends up being that there's some kind of blooper that he, embar he embarrasses himself right and this is sort of like the anxious person who gets into a, an embarrassing scrape in a social situation is like a classic uh scenario that I've always really liked and and related to um also I think you know the 
it's hard to say what the offline response would be, right? Because you have so much more input from the online context. And that's something that's interesting to me because people will always say, well, like Twitter is not real. And it's like, well, it is like, it is a reality. It's just not the only reality, right? Um, and I, I, I suppose, I suppose neuroticism aside, what <laughs> has, <laughs> we can put it aside. I mean, maybe it's not neuroticism, but the spirit of an online generation, let's say. Right. And I certainly felt that reading it in terms of, on the level of language, on the level of psychology, um, you have captured it. Mm -hmm. in, in, in its kind of online uh, manifestation. Right. But what, so what has been surprising about the book's reception? What has been surprising about the re book's reception? Um, I think- what Unsurprising. And what aspects of the book would you like to talk about that you haven't been able uh -oh. to? Well, I think, actually, I think what was really surprising about the book's reception, which I'm sort of pleasantly surprised by, is how much people want to talk about the like formal experimentation that's in there, right? So part of it is, I was trying to make it a traditional novel, but there are definitely some experimental elements. There's a long section in the middle where the book becomes um, a parody of fragmented novels, which have been quite popular for several years. Uh, and it's also divided into long sections called beginning, middle, uh, one of them is called middle, nothing happens. One of them is called middle, something happens, um, climax. There's a backstory section. Um, so it's really sort of like delineated in this kind of straightforward um, way, right? Uh, and I was, I was sort of surprised that so many people wanted to talk about that and they almost no one, almost, actually, this is something I want to talk about. Almost no one talked about the relationship element, right? Like nobody wants to talk about the fact that it's really about a romantic relationship and um, a sort of disturbing at times romantic relationship. But, but I was a little bit confused about <laughs> why that, that part sort of goes by the wayside, right? What do you think it means? I don't, that, that nobody wants to talk about yeah. it. I think that maybe that, that, um, I'm a beneficiary of feminism. They wanted to talk about my formal, my formal experimentation and my craft as a novelist, and they don't want to talk about um, my ex-boyfriends. <laughs> I love. Can you just tell the audience briefly? Um, so, so, kind of throughout, yeah, throughout the the novel, you have they're almost like a Greek chorus. I was uh -huh. thinking them almost like a Greek chorus. What, why? Can you explain a little bit about? Um, their place, their kind of small but hilarious place in the novel. Why did you choose them as kind of an omnipresence looking in on, on the story? I, I mean, I wish I could figure out how I thought. So I think I was writing, I wrote the book more or less straight through uh, because it I came up with the whole plot at the beginning. So I had these sort of signposts, there are two twists. So I wrote from the beginning to one twist and then from that twist to the next twist and then I did the end. Um, and I think just early on at one point, the narrator is trying to tell the reader something about herself. She's always trying to sort of like, people say this, manage manage the reader's expectations of her, which ultimately I think sort of, um, uh, she learns her lesson by the end that you can't do that. But she's constantly sort of like telling you cutesy, cutesy little facts about herself or giving you little like tidbits about her personality. Um, and sometimes, and I think at one point she sort of thinks, oh, my ex-boyfriend, you know, my ex-boyfriend would disagree with this characterization of me as, as, you know, funny or charming or something or whatever she says. Uh, and then I was just thinking about how like the ex, the ex-boyfriend is an interesting figure or the ex-partner is an interesting figure because they know you in a very particular intimate way, but often you like really want to like get far, far away from that not that knowledge that they have of you, even though it's a quite sort of real, true knowledge. Um, so I thought it would be interesting to have them kind of like doubting her, lovingly mostly doubting her um, narrative that she's telling. And also I think the ex-boyfriend or in general is kind of an interesting figure because you don't know um, how, if someone says, oh, my ex, they could mean someone they dated for three months or someone that they dated for five years, right? And you'd have no idea what the significance of that person is. And I like that sort of ambiguity um, uh, where you don't really know how much to trust the, the source that you're given, which obviously relates to the idea of conspiracy theories and sort of like personal narratives that we are talking about in general.
And it only becomes all the more ambiguous when you make it plural. <laughs> yes, yes. And sometimes she'll pull one out and she's like, oh, this is my worst ex-boyfriend. He always says this. Um, but it yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it seems to me that the figure of the ex-boyfriend is kind of the, it is, almost, he is he or she or the, the ex, let's say. The ex is, is kind of a figure on the internet because that before, I imagine, you, you, that proximity was, was kind of less close because once a relationship ended, you weren't kind of bombarded necessarily by their presence. But now, mm -hmm. because of online mm -hmm. life, I mean, that, that kind of your relationship exists on in some ways. Yeah, and I think too, the I worked, as you mentioned, I worked at a women's website for a couple of years. And um, at the time, it was very sort of uh, popular to sort of rag on one's ex-boyfriends on Twitter or on Instagram or something and like make jokes about them and talk about how you never talk to your ex-boyfriends or whatever. Uh, and and I, I, I usually have kind of a good relationship with my exes, so I never quite understood it, but also I could understand this anxiety of like needing to, needing to distance yourself publicly from your ex because they're always kind of present mm -hmm. on your phone, right? Like they're always possibly contactable and, and talking about their new girlfriend or whatever. Mm. I want to um, get back to the, the plot and then we're going to kind of jump between the plot and then larger kind of issues about form and also your own career as a, as a critic. But um, you mentioned the protagonist who remains unnamed throughout. Um, so she is a blogger. Uh, she moves to Berlin and um, she is she has a strong voice, let's say. And at one point in one of these admissions, as you mentioned to the reader, she says in brackets, teetering as I am between loathsome and likable. Oh, Can yeah. you describe a little bit to the audience? Uh, what is your protagonist? like really and um, did you enjoy writing her yeah I had a great time writing her I wish I hadn't made that joke actually because because everybody then said that of course she's not likable and she knows it and I was like you know I once interviewed um Phoebe Waller-Bridge who who made the show Fleabag uh and I had just in, right, in case any in case you don't know who she is <laughs> Um, she and and everybody all the reviews of the show had just come out when I was about to talk to her and she all the reviews were like an unlikable woman presented with like you know no you know no filter blah 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 and unlikable unlikable and I was like um, Phoebe Waller-Bridge do you feel like the Fleabag character is unlikable because I find that she's extremely likable and that's part of like why she's kind of evil and bad because she's really charming and funny and like makes light of her foibles even when they're quite severe uh, and um, I think you know I think I hope that the protagonist is quite enjoyable to be around even if she's sort of wicked in the same way right um, and I think when she says that she's unlikable, it's partially a joke about the idea of the unlikable woman, right? Being a kind of great subject for literature, but also I think at that time she's, she's saying, I'm not going to tell you how cheap my rent was because I know that I'm already being really obnoxious and I don't want you to hate me more because I was paying this really cheap rent. Um, uh, but also at that point she started to lie to all of these boyfriends and concoct sort of elaborate um personal different personalities right to, like, like your protagonist people. yeah oh oh she the protagonist has yes yeah yeah no as in yeah. like as in like the protagonist in your book right yeah yeah exactly um so so you but so you so you ultimately like 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 her and oh like I her. like her and I had a lot of fun I hope that it's fun yeah. to read because I had a lot of fun writing yeah. it. and I think it's hard to be funny if you're not um in a sort of like funny <laughs> fun in like space while you're doing it it's yeah it's definitely a lot of fun to read and I can and you definitely tell that I mean fun on kind of a large scale um the end is truly shocking I mean really it, it, it almost wins you um and, and so kind of like structurally and, and the big picture is is moving, but then also the kind of small, there's, there's, there's basically something fantastic in between every paragraph and every page. There's, there's, there are almost sound bites. I mean, that's the kind of internet creeping in, I think, to the prose. Mm -hmm. um, right. Yeah. 
Elif Bataman gave an interview, I think, for the White Review, and she said when she was editing her novel, The Idiot, she, that she never cut something if it made her laugh. And I think <laughs> that's great. I think that's great. I think that there's yeah. an attitude towards um, writing now sometimes that you need to you need to kill your darlings, right? That that yeah. sort of phrase, um, and you, that that you need to sort of hone and clarify and make everything sort of like a, a little diamond. And I don't like that because then sometimes you cut a joke and yeah. you should always keep the jokes I think <laughs> <laughs> um okay let's go back to the context of the novel because it was born out of a very particular moment you started writing it just after the election of Trump in 2016 and the book is indeed set in the immediate aftermath of the election it includes a long treatment of the women's march for example um and you have described Lauren that the language used around that time was, I mean, the world was being, at least in America, <laughs> was being spoken about in kind of grave apocalyptic terms. Can you just describe a little bit about the context in which this novel was born? Yeah, I think um, there was this like, there. I mean, part of the thing that was interesting to me was that people were like, well, no one's reading novels anymore, clearly. We've done, we're done, we're done with novels and we're done with all art that doesn't make explicit reference to the political situation because, you know, it's so dire. And obviously that wasn't true. Um, but the, what I was sort of wanted to make sure was that it got the period right, but also that it it had enough, um, it wasn't just signifiers for the period, right? Like I wanted it to be a sort of like description of the period so that if someone reads it in 2040 or 2100, provided we're all still here uh, as the human race, uh, that, that they get a sort of sense of like, you know, if you read a novel about, um, London in the 1890s or something, or you read a novel about New York City in the 70s, you do get a sense of like what New York City in the 70s is like, even though that's not the point of reading that novel, right? The point of reading that novel is it's about someone having an affair or it's about the writing life or, you know, whatever. It's about um, the aristocracy in, in London or something. Uh, and I wanted this novel to, to serve that purpose, right? To have a kind of universal or like lasting enduring theme, but also to accurately describe the historical moment, basically. Yeah, you mentioned that um, you kind of reject this idea that, or, or there are questions, I suppose, in, in the aftermath of Trump's election that can art, uh, can art kind of exist because now it needs to be political and you yourself have written about um, the kind of the, the finding the political in in writing mm -hmm. and have rejected uh, or maybe kind of argued against the idea that all art needs to make a political point. Um, you wrote in the New York Times in 2018 uh, an essay called What Do We Mean When We Call Art Necessary? Um, and so I'm wondering, I guess, for from you, and then actually this 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 kind of comes from a question that the your protagonist asks the reader at one point towards the end. Uh, she asks, "What can we learn from literature?" Oh yeah. So I I, <laughs> I was going to say this towards the end, but since, since you brought up the kind of the political uh, in in art, I mean, I can ask ask you now. Sure. Oh, what can we learn from literature? Yeah, what can we learn um, from literature? Well, I actually I don't know that. I don't know that I personally have gotten a lot of my political education from literature. I don't know that I, I haven't, right? But I would describe myself as like a, a pretty left person, but, but all of my sort of political experiences are, um, I learned about them through in the particular experiences that I've had in my life uh, and you know through, through like more directly political means um, I don't typically go to unless it's like a, a political documentary like you know if it's a documentary about the Vietnam War then I'm learning about the Vietnam War right but but I don't go to art for that necessarily um, I go to it for a sort of more complicated um, existential metaphysical like etc academic adjective whatever academic adjective you want to use purpose um, and um, so I never thought of like novels that way I never thought of them as and what the article you're referring to, it was in response to, you'll constantly see novels described as a necessary sort of 
correction to something or like a necessary book in some way or another. And it always means like, there are tons of books you could read, but you have to read this one because the political thing that it describes is a quite urgent situation. And I think it, um, that kind of treatment of art sort of uh, like ends up actually um, disadvantaging or sort of insulting the artist because it sort of boils down all of this kind of complicated work that they might do to, you know, what is basically <laughs> a yes or no question or like a what side are you on question. Um, and uh, it, it is sort of innervating, I think. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, and, and I just wanted to quote you because you wrote the kind of the, one of one of the great sentences in in the article was this attempt to infuse art with purpose runs the risk of rendering it even more irrelevant. Well, also I think that there's this books especially have this problem of um, novelists and book people tend to be quite self defeating because they'll say like oh well nobody's reading books anymore you know nobody cares about books. And the idea that you should make people care about books by making them so, like respond directly and sort of didactically to the most urgent political questions of the day is really, um, I think more self-defeating because that's not what people go to books for. Um, and also, um, you know, it just sort of makes them, it makes them act like anything else. So it, it sort of renders them even more purposeless because there's no reason that you should get your didactic political message from a 300, 400 page novel when you could just get it from a tweet or a short article or, or, or something like this, right? Yeah, it's interesting that um, you talk about this idea of kind of relevance, irrelevance. I, I really want to talk about um, language in, in, the, in the novel because part of the aftermath of, of this election of, of Trump was also, and you pointed this out in the book, this kind of quick pr proliferation of certain vocabulary, like you say strongman, authoritarian, mm -hmm. uh, and so on and so on. And you write that it was, uh, that this language felt wrong. It mm -hmm. felt ripped from the past and pasted onto the present. It, it's rough edges, visible and curling. Um, and kind of throughout the book, you, you come back to language and the way that we're communicating um, the way that the in internet is influencing our communication, both online and offline, the kind of offline with our phone sitting with its screen face down at lunch on the table, for example. Um, and you wrote in the LRB in, in 2020, the internet's contribution to language um, has been to give us more ways to communicate without saying anything at all. Can you talk a little bit about kind of the, the deterioration of language and how did you highlight that deterioration of language in the novel without <laughs> having your own language deteriorate itself? Sure. Well, I think the difficulty with writing now is that the internet sort of like produces cliches much more rapidly and it allows you, if you're particularly canny or you have a lot of time on your hands, to sort of track where how the cliche went from someone making some kind of political comment on Twitter or, or something like that to uh, you know, a journalist maybe seeing it and then putting it in an op-ed in the New York Times. And then maybe Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez gives a speech in which she refers to whatever op-ed was in the New York Times or she draws on some of the same sources as what was in the New York Times, right? And so you can watch like, certain language and for me it's interesting to watch this happen to academic language um right so we will often see sort of academics or lecturers or whomever on twitter sort of like aiming to teach people something like acting like a sort of public intellectual or or sort of like a disseminator of knowledge in some way and they will make these statements online and then certain vocabulary words and often not like the most simple vocabulary words will become like trendy and people will start using them and it's really fascinating to watch but that means that you're often in danger if you're a novelist of using a word that in six months or a year will be become sort of stale and like 
indicate like that you were part of a fad, right? So it becomes quite difficult. Um, and one of the ways I tried to solve this is sometimes when I wanted to refer to the fact of, of this phenomenon or those words, I italicized them. Um, and also there has been a conversation about um, not italicizing foreign languages in English language novels as, as one, you know, the copy editor typically will italicize like a French sentence or, or, or whatever. Uh, and I have all the German words in the novel in Roman, so they're not italicized, but all of these kind of like weird slang words um, are italicized basically. Yeah, you talked about this kind of algorithmic thinking and I wanted to read a very brief passage from kind of the middle of the novel that describes this really well. Um, so this is, I think, oh look, and then Elif Batiman comes up on this page. It's nice. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so I, I, this is, I think, kind of in the middle of, of the, the internet, the foray into internet dating. Um, and so your protagonist um, writes, I would like to have, I would have liked to assume serendipity orchestrated by a force so high and powerful that it had to be magic, but it was merely topicality, a combination of algorithms and forces so unexciting that people could only rampage about their effects rather than their causes. Things were discussed because they were blunt and shocking, because they applied to obvious impulses. This is the key sentence. Discussion beget, beget more dis, beget, beget. Discussion beget more discussion, and that discussion begat imitation. People became exacerbated with the same things and produced the same thoughts. And actually, it's on the level of thought that I think it's particularly dangerous, right? Yeah, yeah, it's scary. And yeah. um, it, what's also scary, and uh, I think a lot of the reason why I started writing the book was that I would watch people do things online and I was just like, why are you doing this? I don't understand your motivation for doing this. I don't understand why you like are what? acting this in this way. <laughs> I mean, even just really banal, like getting in fights with, mm. with other people online, right? Or like, mm. there's a scene very briefly where the, the narrator's... Um, roommate in New York is having a sort of an affair with a famous journalist. Yeah. The famous journalist girlfriend finds out and then she tweets a picture of the journalist and is like, this man is trash. Don't ever talk, you know, don't ever give him a job. Don't ever talk to him again. And like things like that, mm -hmm. I would just watch and, and just be sort of grimly fascinated and, and you can't look away from it. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you're like, is the motivation for these things so um ob is it the is it the obvious thing right like everybody just wants attention everybody just mm -hmm. wants sort of a group of people to agree with their ideas and follow them and I think this is a very long way of responding to your question which was about the like imitative thought patterns that the internet produces but one of the things that I sort of can't believe is that you often will see writers like saying the same things that everyone else is saying and I don't understand what the motivation for that is basically mm -hmm. and they'll, they'll say like so many things become slogans so many things just become repeated over and over and and you it it because I mostly follow writers you know I'm unfortunately a writer myself so I only can really speak to like writerly communities on the internet but what's amazing about them is that so many of writers seem to want to say this want they want to publish essays or critiques or whatever like they want to do that and they in those critiques they want to say the same thing that everyone else has already said and I just don't really understand that as a motivation. This actually um, kind of leads quite nicely into a com uh, question I wanted to ask you about um, style versus tone. In mm -hmm. fact <laughs> anti-style anti-tone because there's this great moment uh, at the beginning where you describe uh, where your protagonist describes speaks of her time as a blogger because she stops blogging uh, once she once she quits her job dramatically yeah. moves to Berlin dramatically and she writes once I developed my tone a rote pseudo intellectual dismissiveness that could be applied to any topic so as so long as the word political uh, implications were spelled out by the end of the article. Oh yeah. Do you think? I mean. Do you see this online? This like that people just develop their tone as, and then, so then we have tone on the one hand, and then later, much later, so she's in Berlin. She 
she experiences many different funny and, and interesting things, including a whole host of astrological uh, star signs embodied as men <laughs> online. Um, <laughs> uh, and so this is kind of towards the end. She joins a writing group with a character called Nell. And this is the start of a chapter. You write, Nell's writing group consisted of her and me sitting on her salon like bedroom on Karl Marx Strass and discussing ideas of plot and structure her and her not really being into style. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about this distinction or parallelism between tone and style? Sure. I mean, I don't really know how, what the, what exactly the difference is, right? Like, I think that you can produce um, some tone without, without really having a style, right? Like you can sort of imitate tone, but you, you style is quite hard to imitate. Yeah. Um, and I think that there was this long period of internet writing when internet writing like sort of developed in the United States in particular, um, when blogs like Salon and Slate and then Gawker is the real sort of nefarious influence, I think on so many young writers. Uh, it, it was just this like really mean, but self, self-righteous and mean, which seems like uh, not, not, not counterintuitive, but, but it was like a, a, a sort of like crusading, ironic, like knowing meanness that a lot of people adopted and was quite, it's quite sort of like if you think about the goals of the internet writer, which is to basically get as many people to look at your article as possible, um, it does sort of do the trick. It creates a sense, uh, like a, a sense of urgency, um, which is very important. And that also relates to the idea of the necessary book. Like you can only sell something if it's completely urgent because we live in this amazing, horrific time when there are so many sort of things pulling at our interest. So you can only sort of delineate your life in terms of like prior, highest priority um, and also like it creates a like oh there's been a car crash and you're going to be one of the first people to, <laughs> to see what happens right like I've about I'm criticizing someone and it created this idea that like you need to know who's bad right and, uh, and, and that there are tons of bad actors out there and we're going to identify them and like like destroy them with our bonds mods you know what I mean like like it's it's just totally ridiculous um so there's that question that's the sort of tone but the style is remarkably similar because on the internet in order to get all of the sort of clicks that you need you need to have a really sort of clear understandable prose like you can't use a strange vocabulary word you can't use a strange like grammatical structure you can't um if you, you know, hazard a unique phrasing, someone might make fun of you uh, and then nobody's gonna read your article. So it, the style that developed was this really sort of like clear, like I will broke no misunderstandings about my point here kind of thing that is quite sad. I think if you have aspirations to like beauty or um, wit or, or originality or things like this. Um, so I think that's why a lot of, there's a sort of lack of style, uh, in younger writers. And so we talked briefly about this before the call, but I, I want to go into it before we turn to questions from the audience. If the audience has any questions, please go ahead and post them. Otherwise I have many more, um, to keep going, but, uh, be lovely to, to very happy to ask your questions as well. So, um, do you think this is worse in America, Lauren? So we, Something that I'm really interested in, as I was describing, is the kind of distinction between uh, Berlin, Germany, and New York in the mm -hmm. US in the book, um, and certainly kind of looking at America from a European perspective. Um, I just want to read two passages about New York and then kind of highlight the things that we certainly see here in France, um, but in contrast. So this is a, a little passage about New York and how it's changed. So rudeness was a New York trademark, once charming for the way it implied a collective acknowledgement of the struggle of everyday life, a gently reciprocal buzz off, 
yet it had taken on in recent years a ruthless antisocial edge, a broad awareness of how things used to be had severed these things from history so that they were now only pleasingly abstract ideas, repeated and exploited for all purposes. The rudeness now was unearned, just convenient. And then later, uh, this, is, this is kind of an insight also everyone into Lauren's um, very funny and also insightful writing. So mm -hmm. this, is a, this is a funny one. Um, this is describing uh, kind of making plans in Berlin as opposed to New York. And you said, I was mostly in awe of the scheduling. In New York, plans were made weeks in advance and then rescheduled because one or both parties were having mental health issues. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so in, and then in contrast, um, you have kind of the boyfriend slash ex-boyfriend of your protagonist, Felix, describing kind of describing why Berlin, uh, living, in Berlin is, living in Berlin is difficult, but not as difficult, let's say, of living in the US. And he describes the low cost of living, which is certainly true for many European cities and also the robust social safety net <laughs> yes so he well, says we, life was hard but still not as hard yeah i think um so there's always this sort of like base i'm like yeah i would like to have health insurance that actually functioned right that i could actually i was actually um at the german consulate here in new york city the other day because my friend is a translator and he was being knighted um by the german government for services as a translator and i was talking to the german consul general who one has to assume makes quite a good salary that and has a, a cost of living that is subsidized by the german government here in new york city but he <laughs> was saying that he does not go to the doctor in america because he is too afraid of the sort of surprise billing feature of our unique healthcare system. And he doesn't like to go to the doctor because they're always trying to sell you more things. Um, and so this is this is my number one, you know, like basic complaint. But I think there's like a more spiritual, like sort of social element too, which is that um, it's in in Berlin in particular, there's like a sense of like spontaneity is still possible. People still have the energy to like do, to make plans with each other and to do them, even if it's a sort of like, do you want to go hang out right now or in 10 minutes? And people will usually say yes, which is quite nice. And not everyone is so obsessed with their work, uh, which is kind of a cliche. But I think what was interesting to me to, about the expat context in particular is the way that it sort of mirrors the way that people talk about um, social media in these bizarre ways, right? So like, if you are a, a, an expat in Berlin, you're not a real Berliner, or like, you're not like a real, you know, you, if you haven't learned German, you're not a real expat, right? So like, if you're on Twitter, that's not real life. Nobody actually cares about that stuff. And if you, I think a lot of people do go to Berlin in particular, um, in order to like escape uh the idea of like escape reality right like that you don't have to you don't have to work as much or at all right and um there is a funny slogan about berlin which is if you can't make it here you can't make it anywhere and i think that there's like a sort of like take a desire to take advantage of that um which is is unfortunately changing as um many of members of the audience may be aware but um for the time being there is still this sort of like Berlin spirit that has not yet been um, bulldozed and turned into ugly apartments that cost. Yeah, me. and, and <laughs> um, it's also it also occurs to me that not only is there kind of the unreality of being an expat abroad, but then there's the unreality of kind of how that being abroad intersects again with the internet and social media. I mean, Berlin, I'm sure, is guilty of this. Paris is is so kind of uh, of guilty of of um, Host kind of it's a breeding ground for people who are escaping reality yeah literally and then kind of spending their whole lives posting pictures standing by the Eiffel Tower holding baguettes with a I've seen this because because when you come Lauren the American library is truly in the shadow of the <laughs> house you can really see it and there's this one street actually the street where we if you go in the kind of front entrance not the staff entrance if you walk down the street you really have a full kind of view of the Eiffel Tower, it's really right there. And at least once a week, I see somebody dressed up kind of beautifully, it's in a very fancy neighborhood, yeah. with it, holding a baguette that they've just bought with a professional photographer or their boyfriend, 
taking same thing food. these days same thing <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I think Berlin, there's no outfit that you can wear uh, out in daylight, at least in Berlin, that will sort of like exemplify the Berlin experience, luckily. So at least there's not like a, I guess you could have like a beer. Yeah, but it's not really like a, it's a beer, but it's, it's not, it doesn't have the like, it's not like Bavaria, you know, if you wanted to wear Lederhosen and have a pretzel and take a picture like in, in front of I don't know the English garden in, in Munich that's one thing but in Berlin like the the s sort of touristic appropriation is quite interesting because it's like oh we're gonna ruin all of the clubs here which were amazing right like we're going to ruin all of these kind of like underground bars and we're going to um like say some like vaguely stupid stuff about the GDR right um and so there's a little bit of that in the book and I'm really interested in like in Berlin tourism and tourism in general and and like what is an appropriate way to be a tourist uh what is an appropriate way to engage with another culture particularly in this kind of digital age mm -hmm. right um mm -hmm. when you can you know you can learn a lot of stuff about anywhere that you're going on the internet and you can use Google Translate and communicate with anyone who's around you. Um, but actually probably most of the people around you speak English, so it doesn't really matter. Mm. Um, and I don't really, you know, I don't really know what the answer is to those questions, right? Like, is it like, how terrible <laughs> is it if there's a couple of streets in Paris where someone is having a baguette and taking a picture in front of the Eiffel Tower? Like how many streets is too many streets mm. for that, right? Mm. I don't, I mean, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. What do I think? I think, um, <laughs> I think Paris is so beautiful. Every street, uh, at least we're talking about the kind of, it was really interesting now um, in, in Paris. And maybe this is, I, I don't think there's the kind of myth of, of the Berlin, the person of Berlin, but there is certainly the myth, certainly of the woman, La, La Parisienne, oh, yeah. the, the, the Parisian woman. Yes. Um, but that's, that, that, that has now, started to be deconstructed and actually interestingly by by an American well French writers but also kind of predominantly by an American journalist who's here who's really writing about it and interviewing um French women who kind of defy what we think of as the kind of white <laughs> like, um, <laughs> yeah. thin, rich uh, on her bicycle um Parisian woman so I do think it, it takes and that was that was going to be my next question. Do you think you would have written the same book if you hadn't spent time in Berlin? No, I mean, part of the reason why I wanted to set it there, I think it was like incredibly, I thought the expat thing was quite incredibly interesting and, and it fits and it makes total sense to set it there. But part of the reason I wanted to set it there was just, just that I love it there and I wanted to write about it. And I hadn't read that many books written by English speakers that um, effectively like, thread the needle where you can talk about your experience of the city without sort of like acting like you know very much about it because you don't know very much about it because you're a foreigner right and um I think there is um an interesting thing with with Berlin and Germany in particular where I think they don't um you know there's there's not a sense of like German culture needs to be protected in the same way that say France has and there's an obvious reason for that but the sort of um result is that I think like rich white westerners from mainly the United States Australia and the UK <laughs> like come in and they're like we don't have to learn German right like we don't have to know anything about what's going on and I think that that's quite sad and also it limits your experience in Berlin among other things like it's not you know if you can't go to any of the cultural events or talk to anyone it's not that it's not it's, it's not the same thing um so I wanted to to sort of like describe it in a loving way and I hope that it come, like comes through but also sort of like think about this question of how to how to love a city that you aren't from and that is experiencing as Berlin is like extreme sort of gentrification and a housing crisis and all of these sorts of things. 
Right, and this is a challenge that your protagonist face and faces and face and will continue to face as she lives on in your book. Um, <laughs> I, I do want to ask you, so many people had asked you about the auto fiction kind of element of this. I really didn't want to get into it too much, but you must have known writing it that, that was going to come up again and again. Well, what I think is crazy is that people will apologize before asking, not you, not you haven't done this, but, but someone yeah. will be like, I'm sorry, but I have to ask. I'm sure you hate to talk about autofiction. And I'm like, no, I clearly love autofiction. There's a book about autofiction, right? It's a book about like yeah. stories that seem like they're true, but actually they have elements of fiction in them. And then it makes right. it go in a different direction. Um, and so I was thinking quite a lot about autofiction. And I um, also what do, you think, sort of, what do you think about it? I think it's, I mean, I think it's a little bit overblown as a, I don't even know how you how you have an overblown concept, but I think people are just like calling everything auto fiction these days, and I think we need to dial it back. I think also the idea that like some people will say there's no definition of it, which is not true either, um, as you would know in France. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, you know, I think it's particularly relevant now. Like it's pop. It's re it has its you know it's repopularized, a great word, uh, now because I think of a lot of the questions that social media and before reality TV brought up, right? So mm -hmm. like we're constantly being given stories that we're told are true, but we're supposed to like be able to interpret their, their kind of like what parts of them are not quite true like not objective right like which parts of them have been massaged like we have to be able to interpret the source we have to be able to interpret um like the like the I, you know we have to be able to interpret all sorts of things like the motivation behind the stories that we're being told right and i think it's very compelling to be given like something that is on the other hand, you're told that it's fictional, but actually you can understand that it has been pulled from life. And so it sort of um, like scratches that itch for like a true story without having to, um, without the author having to like uh, sign off on everything <laughs> that the protagonist is doing, right? Um, yeah, that's my and 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 so you know you've kind of you spoke about Ben Lerner and your and this work has been compared to works of or a lot of people who kind of were reviewing it were saying it has elements of all of these kind of following writers so mm -hmm. Sheila Hetty, Michael Thomas, Sam Lansky, mm -hmm. um, Knausgaard, Jenny Ophill. Uh, were you thinking about these writers when you were writing it? I mean and then interestingly right at the beginning of our conversation you said as a critic I was kind of as a book critic, which of course you are, and continue to be, I was looking out kind of the landscape of novels emerging and I wasn't seeing this kind of novel. I mean, did you, did you write this novel to kind of fill that gap? And also when you wrote it, you were kind of incorporating elements from these other writers? Yeah, I think I was thinking a lot about about like what would come after the auto fiction boom or the trend, right? Like, what do you do yeah, after post, that? Post auto fiction. Yeah, po yeah. Post, I think yeah. post auto fiction is even what I was calling it. Um, <laughs> and I was like, well, <laughs> what? Hashtag. I Hashtag. know, um, yeah. everybody's coining terms left and right. But I was like, I, what if you put the auto fictional narrator in a sort of plottier, like clearly, you know, you know the, the narrative, the sort of, premacy elements of this narrative none of which happened to me right like so so what if you put put projected me that project is the word that Ben Lerner uses in 1004 he describes what he's doing in the book and he's saying I'm going to project myself into several futures simultaneously or something like that um and what if as you know what are you saying okay well what if I projected myself into this kind of like bizarre absurd realistic situation um and like gave it a plot uh and and what might become of that right um and it's not also I think something that is kind of nice about writing fiction is that you can you can think something quite uncharitable or you can think something and you can write it down and it becomes attached to the character but you don't have to you don't have to believe it for a long period of time right so like 
the idea that the character is me or the idea that Sheila Hetty's characters are her, for example, is another person who gets, she gets like quite a lot of flack for her characters. Um, Did you, you got a lot of flack? No, I don't, a couple, a bit, but I think it was more like people are mad that I write negative book reviews and less. How do you handle flack? I don't, I just ignore it, ignore it. Um, uh, well, I don't ignore it. I read it, but I don't comment upon it so that other people can see it. Do you mm -hmm. see what I'm saying? <laughs> right? like very the algorithm. Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, maybe like think about it. And if it's something, if it's like a serious criticism that seems to to be something I should think about, then I'll think about it. But mm -hmm. you know, if someone is like trawling through a podcast that I did six years ago and like making uncharitable assumptions mm. about me mm. I don't really care um <laughs> <laughs> it's their problem uh but I think like I think what's nice about writing fiction is that you can have an impulsive thought and then you can make that part of the characterization of of your sort of avatar but you don't yeah let's I, I think what's the thing that I feel bad about saying I I can't, I'm talking about the blog that she works for and she works in an office and, and she says um at one point oh I'm the only person in the office who knows how a semicolon works and of course that is not literally true of the website that I worked for there were several people on staff who knew how a semicolon worked <laughs> Um, but that's the kind of thing that you think when you're like really frustrated with your office, right? And you're like, nobody here knows anything about grammar and they're all professional writers. Um, so obviously I would not write a Guardian op-ed that was called, I worked at Vice Media and no one knew how to use a semicolon because that's not true. It doesn't have to be true if you are putting it in the mind of the character. Does that make, does that make sense of what I'm saying? It does, it totally doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> isn't isn't um david fossil david fossil was famous for giving his students c's if they misuse if the, if they want do you know this that if if one student like misuse a semicolon that would be immediate either like c or failure of the class that sounds right but i didn't know that tidbit of david foster wallace lore actually <laughs> yeah it's probably lore. um uh okay well we had no questions. I mean, I'm, I'm here. If anyone wants to post a question, yep. we've all been very quiet and, and um, charming this evening. I hope uh, you've enjoyed the conversation. What we could do, and let me see if people, I, I have it in speaker view. Yeah, we can also do, Lauren, if you have an extra kind of 10 minutes, we could do a breakout room, mm -hmm. uh, which allows basically people to ask you questions themselves. Sure. Would you want to yeah. do that? It's quite nice. It's kind of yeah, like... Yeah. It replicates the uh, end of event um, experience. So for everyone who's listening, I'm about to read out all the official end of event um, advertisements, etc. And then after that, I will um, click on this button that will open up the breakout room and then you can click join and then you can ask Lauren your question yourself by unmuting yourself. People are already leaving because they're too scared. <laughs> yeah, well, of course, on, they're not going great. to do it. This is a great opportunity to stay on and actually ask Lauren a question. Um, Karen says, I'm enjoying listening. I'm reading Flora Yegi right now to write an article about her. That's actually, her. before we end, can you talk about your new novel? <laughs> oh, my new novel. I can't talk about my new novel. I have 12,000 words of it. Um, but... Uh, Did you start writing, how long, you started writing it how long after your, after the first one? I started writing it like three months ago or something. So oh, really? As you took a really good break? Yeah. Um, I just didn't have any good ideas. Uh, and I am writing a collection of essays called Who Cares that I have to write before I finish the other novel. But mm -hmm. it's good, I find, to have um, two projects, two at once so that you can use the one, you use the novel to procrastinate writing the other one. Mm -mm -mm. Do you, do you, I guess this will be my last question because we're now over time, but what, what, what do you, what is the relationship between your criticism and, and, and novel writing? Do you think? I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea. I don't think, uh, I think that there are certain you prefer things. one? I mean, is it like you write novels in the morning and then you write criticism, you know? 
I think it's more fun to write a novel. Um, yeah. it's, I also just think that there are certain things, at least as an essayist, I don't know how to sort of like ethically or sort of pra practically write about certain things. Like sometimes I want to write about the way people are in the street or like the way people are at a party. And I don't really want to write about that in a nonfiction context because then maybe you get in trouble um, and poor people accuse you of making generalizations um, or things like this. But uh, if you write about the way people are at a party in a novel, you are celebrated for writing a, an absurd and incisive social commentary, right? So, mm -hmm. so they're just sort of things like that that mm -hmm. I find helpful. Mm -hmm. But I also think my essays probably don't tend to have like a, like, don't tend to have like a super clear delineated thesis statement or like an argument that you can sort of chart right through the thing. And I think the reason that's why I like writing novels as well, because you don't need to have a sort of um, argument that you can tweet out or that you can kind of uh, pitch, right? Mm 